Coming to you from Brick House in downtown Brooklyn, this is 112BK. On the show today, Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights City Council member Robert Cornegie Jr., the mental health of millennials and finding your voice after trauma. Hi, thanks for joining us today. I'm Ross Tuttle sitting in for Ashley Ford. A few weeks back, we brought you some news about what the Times labeled the worst post office in the city in Kensington. Most seem to be on the spectrum of bad, but this one had really distinguished itself. Now they're doing it again, according to a report in Patch, because employees are taking advantage of special parking placards to park on the sidewalk. Not sure why they'd need this special exemption. There aren't any signs that say no parking on the sidewalk. Well, that's because it's a sidewalk. In fact, there's a movement and a hashtag trying to expose this and other instances of so-called placard corruption. It's a pretty robust thread, and the individuals, they seem really dedicated. Not sure if they're gaining much traction, but you gotta admire their moxie. They stem from the noble tradition of tweet venting about city woes, like the hashtags that sprung up last summer. You'll remember MTA Summer of Hell, Cuomo's MTA, and Fix the Subway! Can you put exclamation points in hashtags? The handle for the placards, by the way, Placard abuse. If you have your own city complaint related hashtag or handle, please send us a note at 112BK comments at brickartsmedia.org and we'll be sure to share it. On the show today, the prominent second term city council member from central Brooklyn, Robert Cornegie Jr., will talk about the items on his legislative agenda and the inner workings of the city council, an outlet for millennials concerned about mental health, and after experiencing sexual violence, a woman finds her voice and empowers others to do the same. But first, these things. The city's Department of Education is investigating a Brooklyn public school for creating a poster for a PTA fundraiser, a speakeasy event, because the poster included a photo of men in blackface. It was brought to the attention of the DOE by a concerned community member, and the school's PTA has since issued an apology. Apparently, the 1920s era photo escaped their notice. The PTA co-president for the Maurice Sendak Community Elementary School in Park Slope said, there are no acceptable excuses. My privilege as a white person requires that I be conscientious, engaged, and informed when representing our community and promoting events. Another Brooklynite died from the flu this weekend, it appears. That would make it the fourth child to die from the flu this winter in the city. Flu's a killer, said one city doctor, citing the worldwide epidemic of precisely 100 years ago when the so-called Spanish flu killed approximately 100 million people, about 5% of the Earth's population. Now we've come a long way in the past century, at least as far as medicine is concerned, but this year's flu is a doozy. And the Centers for Disease Control say the season could last until May. Even though for this year the shot is only 10 to 30% effective, that's a comforting range, they're still recommending you get it. Protecting yourself, they say, protects others. Full disclosure, I've not gotten the shot. No excuse. And could it be, well, while we still don't have countdown clocks in all the city subway stations, they may be coming to the bus lines, or at least they are coming to a single bus line in Park Slope. They're at the Wi-Fi kiosks along the B63, and according to city council member Brad Lander, who helped make it happen, there are about 20 locations along Fifth Avenue. Check them out and let us, or him, at Brad Lander, know how accurate they are. Stay tuned for Councilmember Cornegie. Over the last few shows, we've been speaking with city council members as the legislative agenda is set for this year and beyond. We've also been fascinated on this show by the power dynamics of the council and how decisions get made inside baseball to some, or should I say basketball, considering our next guest, but I'll get to that in a minute. But because local politics are just as important, if not more important, to your day-to-day -day lives, we hope you've been finding this edifying and interesting. Today we welcome Robert Cornegie Jr. of Brooklyn District 36. Thanks for coming to 112BK. My pleasure, thank you. So I do want to dig into some of the council issues in a moment, but first, I feel like I have to ask you, and I hope this isn't boring for you, I want to talk about your time at St. John's. Yes. And that this story. This is a perfect time to talk about it. Storied team as a member of that 80s team with Mark Jackson, Chris Mullen, Walter Berry. Walter Berry, what was that like? It you was, guys went to the final. It was four. awesome. Like we were looking back now, we were we were rock stars. Like that that team had the city's a heart yeah. in it, right? And I think pri primarily because the team was comprised of kids from the five boroughs. 
and that hadn't been the case before. You know, right. recruiting is such that you get the best from around the world, but we, we kept it local. Mark Jackson, Chris Mullen, both Brooklyn boys, That's right, right that's right. right. Mark was my roommate. In that wow, sometimes. oh my God. Mark Jackson, he's gone on to do some, you know, he's been all right, right? Yeah, he's been all right. He's Chris been has been all right. All right. Uh -huh. I talked to Bill Wennington the other day. He's got three championships with the Bulls. Uh -huh. So so not, right. not, not much spoken about, but he did all right for himself. And you were back up to Bill Wennington. Yeah, I was back up to Bill Wennington, Right, yes. so for those who are listening who aren't seeing you here and who haven't met you, you're 6'11 and change? Yeah. Yeah, 611 and change. We just went through a battery of, of uh, measurements because, uh, according to the Guinness Book, apparently I'm the tollest elected official in the world. Oh, wow. So, wow. So we just had to do this battery. So it's 611 and three quarters. So when you and Bill de Blasio are in the same room and maybe standing side by side, that's a... Uh that's a tall crowd. Yeah, it could be a little awkward for him because <laughs> someone is taller, but yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you got about six inches on him. Yes, well, at least. All right. So, so I digress. Now, well, let's talk about uh, the council. Um, so you represent the 36th. That's Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights. Yeah. Um, some issues that often come up when you talk about these, uh, these neighborhoods, affordable housing, gentrification, development. Um, Talk to me about these sort of competing pressures, and are they competing, and, and what are your constituents saying about them? And, yeah, so, you know, uh, uh, juxta juxtaposed to this idea of gentrification, uh, we have the distinction in Bed-Stuy of having um, the largest uh, amount of equity per capita than any place else in America. Well, so what that means is my mom and dad purchased our property on Green Avenue, you know, in the 60s, 70s wow. for $12,000, and now it's worth $2.5 million. Wow. Right, so that's that's a large amount of equity. So there's literally gold in them Nar Hills, <laughs> uh, right? So you have that on one side, and then on the other side you have uh, escalating rents brought on by uh, the demographics changing exponentially. Um, so it, it, it makes for kind of a volatile environment, especially socioeconomically. Mm -hmm. And, and obviously, ethnically, mm -hmm. the, the changes are very demonstrative and very pronounced right. in so, the community. So there's a lot of pressure on people to sell, people who might not ordinarily want to sell, or people who may be taking advantage of, who got kind of caught in the housing crunch in 2008. I mean, so what's happening? I mean, are people getting displaced? Or is your, are your constituents concerned about this? Do they feel these pressures yes. of development and displacement? It's, it's a huge uh, a concern for the community, right? When a, when a demographic has uh, predominated uh, anywhere, uh, for such a long time, when change, which unfortunately is inevitable, begins to happen, uh, it's uncomfortable for everyone. And so legislatively, are you able to do anything to kind of ease some of the, that discomfort? Well, you know, this is a free market economy, so uh, legal sales of properties you can't intervene as government on. Uh, so although we'd like those properties not to change hands as quickly as they are, and then it's escalated by the fact that there is a lot of illegal practices that are taking mm -hmm. place. There's deed theft and deed fraud where people are literally stealing people's homes. Right. Uh, but by, that by, you can do something about. That we can do something about and that we legislate. So for example, I have a piece of legislation uh, that calls on um, uh, the Department of Finance to alert mm -hmm. uh, members to any time that there's a deed transfer or a quick, quick sale deed uh, gets flagged immediately. So that was one way that we began to look at. And then we had um, our um, attorney general pump $6 million into central Brooklyn uh, into nonprofits mm -hmm. for deed theft and deed fraud. So we are, you know, looking uh, at it and putting resources where they need to be to help protect, especially homeowners in right. this crisis. Right. Okay. Well, so to, just to shift gears a little bit um, and to talk about the council and the makeup, there's been a little bit of shakeup in the balance of power in the council in, in this term, right? Um, and I think in the previous term, some felt the council was a little too close to the mayor. Yes. And so the Progressive Caucus, which that was, has lost some of its power. How is the current makeup of the council going to serve as more of a check on the mayor? And is that, and why is that an important thing? Well, I think those of us who, who uh, were in that run for speaker pool mm -hmm. uh, committed to being a check and balance and committed to using the body uh, the way it was designed to be as, you know, uh, uh, an equal balance to the administration. And so far, you know, uh, Corey, who was our new speaker, has demonstrated Corey the Johnson. ability to stay focused on making sure that we're an independent voice and we actually speak for the 51 districts mm -hmm. that make up the city. So it doesn't have to be contentious, but uh, I think uh, a line has been drawn in the sand by the current speaker, uh, not to want to fight administration, but to be um, an independent voice and body and not a rubber stamp for everything that comes out of the administration. Was it a rubber stamp last term? I mean, did it feel like something was missing, that there wasn't that kind of pressure and, and sort of like... Uh, I, I think that there was a us. general sentiment that the needs of the body may not have been the priority, mm. right? So 
Uh, it seems as though the Can you give me an example of that? Um, I think uh, a lot of times uh, things would come to the floor mm -hmm. uh, that may have put individual members in jeopardy right. based on what their communities wanted. Uh, of, you know, for example, um, one of the good examples would be uh, the idea to take down the Columbus statue. Hmm. Uh, we have several Italian Americans who are members of the body who took exception to that. Hmm. And, you know, so we have different mer uh, members. And one of the things that makes the council uh, so beautiful is the mosaic and the representation. So we have Italian Americans, we have African Americans, we have Asian Americans. Um, and so it, 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 there's a requirement to take everyone's uh, needs and the needs of their constituents into consideration. And some of the members I know who I spoke to personally during that crisis uh, felt as though their needs and their communities weren't taken into consideration okay. in, in, the, in, you know, in the, the call for that action to be taken. I see. Okay. Well, um, just to talk a little bit more about the council makeup real quick. I just, you know, something that I've been intrigued by in reading when the, the recent um, speaker was elected, nominated, and how he came to, to be the speaker excuse me, how he came to be the speaker, that the speakership is kind of chosen or helped along by these power brokers, I guess, in, in the boroughs and in the different counties, right? They hold some power. And that um, Speaker Johnson made his way there because he had the support of the Bronx and the Queens. And can you talk to me a little bit about that dynamic? Yeah, I think, you know, <coughs> there's a lot of people who'd like to see a more democratic process take place as it, re as it relates to leadership and representation uh, around the city. I think some people took exception to the idea that these decisions could be made uh, kind of in a vacuum and without the input of the entire city. And by the entire city, I mean the 51-member body. Now, I said during my process that I wasn't quite ready to absolve myself of my responsibility and my vote for the 150 or so thousand members that I represent. Mm -hmm. um, so some people would have liked to see that as a tenant. Um, that hasn't been the case. It wasn't the case in, in this instance. So I think that there may be some room to look at that process mm -hmm. to be more inclusive of not only the members, but, right. you know, it's inside baseball, right? It's not a general vote that takes mm -hmm. place. The 51 members vote for their leadership, which is how it should be. Uh, but some people believe that there's too much input mm -hmm. uh, from outside influences, including labor, including the counties, you know, including uh, members of particular caucuses, mm -hmm. as opposed to being one member, one vote. Will you come back sometime to talk to us a little bit more about this? I'm curious, I hope our, our um, viewership is as well, just about how this works and how these dynamics work, because I'd love to get into it more. But, Absolutely, yeah. like we're looking at, you know, <laughs> from an administrative standpoint or from a, a, a federal standpoint mm -hmm. of kind of a debacle in, in, as it relates to the democratic process and whether or not a whole nother country weighed in on our democratic process. So I think it's a great time to begin to talk about a restructuring perhaps of the way we do things in terms of uh, uh, electoral politics, right. not only in this country, but yeah. locally. Absolutely. Uh, so to shift gears again, um, I wanted to talk about crime, where it went way down last year. Welcome news for everyone. Uh, historically, your district um, has seen has some of the precincts that have been pretty active when it comes to stop and frisk, broken windows policing. Um, I wonder what you've been hearing from your constituents recently. Has there been a peace dividend, though, with this drop in crime? Yeah, so, you know, uh, the, the thing is that even when things are great in some communities, they don't realize that until, you know, my community is one that although there seems to be a reduction in crime overall throughout the city, uh, it may not necessarily feel so much in my district, right? Um, there is a reduction, and we, and, and we can see uh, homicides are down 100 percent. And I think that the crimes that are down are based on a, re a relationship or a partnership between law enforcement and between communities. So that's happening all across the city. Uh, it seems a little slower in some communities, or it seems it's not pronounced in some communities like mine, but some people are beginning, and my community is beginning to feel a little safer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, I, I'm, I'm serious, predominantly based on the fact that uh, the relationships are getting better. The new NCO program uh, throughout the city mm -hmm. has, has caused people to have a better uh, relationship with particular officers, mm -hmm. especially those neighborhood uh, officers now. Mm -hmm. uh, people pointed to that all along the, the, yeah. the lines of that would be something that would work. So that seems to be working sure. uh, and, and in my community as well. One other thing that um, just before we, um, um, we were preparing for the show today, a report came out um, 
that the uh, New York League of Conservation Voters, they um, did their scorecard of Brooklyn Council members. Uh, you, may, you may have seen this. Um, you were actually on the low end in terms of support for some environmental legislation, with legislation they deemed important for the environment. Um, how do you respond to that? Well, one of the big hits that I continually take on the scorecard from uh, the League of Conservation Voters for years has been my stance on plastic bags and the plastic bag uh, tax, which I believe uh, in my community and communities like mine who suffer with their, their residents to be below poverty, uh, it seems like a regressive tax. And it's hard for me to sign on. So I said that I thought that we could get to where we wanted to be environmentally by education and not by a tax. And I stand by that, and I think that hurts me uh, with, the, with, 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 with people like the League of Conservation Voters. Well, we have to end it here. I apologize. I'd love to have you back to talk more about this, but we're out of time. Um, and yeah, thank you for coming on. 10 minutes goes way faster than I anticipated. Does, yeah, way too fast. Thanks a lot. Thank you. media, my millennial producer tells me, millennials seem to get a bad rap for, well, almost everything. They're coddled, they mooch off their parents, they won't get a real job. But what the media doesn't discuss often enough is their mental health. Recently, mental health advocate and entrepreneur J. Caleb Perkins, executive director of the Remedy Network, came into the studio to tell Ashley more about his work. Caleb, thank you so much for being here, first of all. I am so glad to be here with you, <laughs> Ashley. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about where your passion for mental health advocacy comes from, especially for millennials? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, just as most millennials, just I got my first job mm -hmm. um, out of college, and I was working um, for a corporate company, which is, mm -hmm. really, it was a great company, but um, I didn't really feel a sense of passion there. Right. And uh, on my lunch break, I read about a kid in the Bronx, um, Khalif Broider, who was mm -hmm. wrongfully convicted of a crime, so on and so forth, um, spent nearly three years in solitary confinement. Oh, yeah. um, and then when he got out, um, unfortunately committed suicide. And I was in Oklahoma at the time when I was reading this story, and um, it just really broke my heart. Mm -hmm. And so it was then, I had never been like Mr. Social Justice or whatever, but after reading his story, it changed my life. Mm -hmm. and. Um, really awakened me to mental health and then just really resourcing young professionals. So, What were some of the things that it shifted for you? Because I know everything doesn't happen right away. Right. You know, I've definitely had moments where something broke for me mm -hmm. and then it just became part of this new path or part of this new journey toward the life I was then going to create for myself based right. off of that moment. Mm -hmm. What are some of the changes you've made since reading about Khalif Browder? Well, after I read that story, I don't ever know if you've ever found a problem and you try and show someone that problem. So right. Like, Do you see what big of a problem this is? Do you see, you know, the effect that this is having on people? And I was always right. pointing to this issue. Um, mm -hmm. And then my mentor told me that that which saddens you the most is what you're designed to solve. Mm. And that which angers you the most is what you're designed to fix. Whew. And so I'm like, why is this angering me so much? And why is this having such an effect on my life? And it was then that I realized that maybe the person to help was me. Right. So shortly after that, I prayed about it and I talked to a lot of my mentors because I knew I was supposed to leave. So right. I, I quit my job maybe about three to four weeks after that. Mm -hmm. um, and I started a nonprofit again on my lunch break wow. um, called Remedy Network. And Remedy, we host educational talks for millennials, mm -hmm. and then we also promote mental health advocacy work. Are there mental health issues that you think millennials are dealing with even a little more than previous generations, mm -hmm. or that are just unique to our generation, or is this just stuff that, you know, our parents are probably dealing with, but they didn't have a name for it? Right, exactly. <laughs> um, I think there's the big ones like, you know, depression, isolation, mm -hmm. anxiety, what have you, but... I think a, a big one that has really reared its head um, recently is probably FOMO, which stands for fear of missing out, yeah. which comes from the scroll, you know, mm -hmm. from, from social media, because we're sitting at our cubicle and we see someone in Florida on the beach. Right. You know? <laughs> so we're like, I automatically hate my life. You know what I'm saying? But right. I think that's the biggest one. And mm -hmm. just being present where we are and not letting the scroll, you know, take us away from where we are living presently. But right. I still love you know, social media, and I think it is a great tool if we use it effectively, so. Right, 
and there are a lot of people I think I'm reading all the time about how social media is negatively yeah. affecting our emotional and mental health. Typically, what mm -hmm. social media has given me personally is this place to go. My people on the <laughs> timeline got me <laughs> exactly. if I say something, you know, that yeah, I just feel like really <laughs> needs to be put out there or something that I'm dealing yeah. with. Yeah. Um, so I like that, you know, specifically for millennials, you're saying, you know, these are the dangers, mm -hmm. you know, of social media and of FOMO and of the scroll, but right. don't forget that it can be a tool used for good. I feel like only a millennial yes. would be able to have that perspective, <laughs> both, <right? laughs> would be able to hold both of those in their mind. Definitely. What are your big goals for the Remedy Network? Uh, my biggest goal is really to see, well, when I think about like my vision for Remedy, um, my goal is to see properly resource millennials in really mm -hmm. every sphere of influence, um, mm -hmm. to really have what they need to be able to, you know, kill it in their industry, but as well to yeah. see properly uh, resource millennials and then well-rounded in their mental health. And you're writing a book. I am. Oh, tell me about it. Definitely. So the really long story of, you know, what we've been talking about, mm -hmm. I put pen to paper and wrote a book fittingly called Remedy Network, mm -hmm. um, which comes out on on Amazon on February 17th of this year. Mm -hmm. um, but the book is written for uh, millennials who are interested in starting an initiative of change, wherever mm -hmm. or whatever that might be. I'm really open about my story about overcoming depression mm -hmm. in the book. And then there's a lot of compelling like leadership lessons that I've learned along the way, which right. I thought would be helpful to me um, when I started, if, if someone, you know, gave me that bit of advice, just even practical stuff like starting a nonprofit, networking, mm -hmm. being able to meet other influencers or what have you. So That's fantastic. Well, thank, thank you. you so much for coming on. I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. This is all stuff really close to my heart, Likewise. so I appreciate it. I'm so happy to be here, Ashley. You're awesome. You're awesome. So thank you. <laughs> J. Caleb Perkins' book, Remedy Network, A Millennial's Journey on Connecting New York City Through Stories, is coming out on February 17th. Our society is fraught with taboos. I'm sure you can think of a couple right off the bat, but one that seems to have finally been broken in the past few months is the taboo against speaking out against sexual assault. Our next guest has fought against that shame and stigma in society and even within her own family. She now works with other survivors as a transformative coach. She's also written a memoir called Mystery of Memory, Telling My Truth, Standing My Ground. Here to tell us more is Deborah Howard. Welcome to 112BK. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. So tell me, what is transformative coaching? Uh, transformative coaching is... Um, uh, if you think about coaching, a lot of times you, you think about like a sports coach, right? Mm -hmm. And so that person is telling you, you know, exercise more, that kind of stuff. That's kind of developmental coaching. Mm -hmm. Transformative coaching is when you actually um, help a person change their mindset because mm -hmm. that's really where change starts from the inside out. Right. Um, and so the coaching I do is not actually targeted towards um, survivors of sexual abuse, although mm -hmm. a number of my um, clients are. Uh, it's really anybody who wants to make change um, of any sort, which mm -hmm. always starts from the inside out. And you mentioned off camera that you spent some years in Japan. I wonder if this is grounded somewhat in, in Buddhism or somewhat in meditation, if that's some of the impetus to some of this. Um, interestingly enough, I don't think it is, mm -hmm. but in terms of how I see the world, it's mm -hmm. fairly Buddhist right. in nature in the sense that I, I, I don't mm -hmm. tend to look at things as either or, but more right. of a both and. Right. And so to talk a little bit about, before we get into the book and some of the particulars, um, about your story. Mm -hmm. um, after decades of, of doubt, having been sexually molested by your father, how difficult was it for you to face the truth of that? And why did you decide to be, be public about it? Um, it wasn't so much that it was difficult to face the truth, although at the beginning I had these very wispy memories, and mm. so part of it was that couldn't possibly be true because right. my parents are both, they've passed away, but they were both wonderful people. They mm. were advocates for racial and social justice. And wow. this is what I mean by sort of the both and. Mm. Um, because in my mind, nobody is one extreme or the other. We're all very complex human beings. Mm. Um, but it was still difficult for me to say that this couldn't possibly be true. Wow. Um, but then I was able to face it because I sort of had no choice. You know, mm -hmm. it became clear to me over the years. 
Wow. And then you, you wrote about it, you went public about it, and you used that, I guess, in your own therapy and maybe as a sort of engine to help others? Um, I really wrote it for myself right. at first. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really through that process that I got to a, a much deeper place in my healing than mm -hmm. I had been, because I thought I was healed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but sort of the more you delve, the more you find. Um, when I started the book, I was actually in a place of um, real self-doubt, mm -hmm. because I had long since reconciled with my parents. I had forgiven them. They had never validated me. Um, and Never when validated the, that, that it, it happened. happened. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I was very close to them in their last years. They died within six weeks of each other. Oh, wow. um, and so shortly after that, I started writing really to explore, is this real? Is it not real? Mm -hmm. And the reason the doubt came is because it was so clear that they loved me mm -hmm. and I loved them. And so then it's sort of this dilemma of, if they really loved you, this couldn't have happened. Yeah, that must be so confusing and right. confounding, yeah. And if they, um, if it is true, then they don't love you, so nobody loves you, you know? Right. So it's sort of this, this vicious, vicious wow. cycle. Wow, Well, tell me, how, how does your experience and what you're doing now kind of fit into the moment that we're in now with the Me Too movement? How do you see the, the relationship? Uh, what I think that's important about the Me Too movement um, is it's really about people breaking silence. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanna um, really put forward that, because I'm not sure everybody knows that the Me Too movement was actually founded by um, Tawana Burke right, many, Tawana Burke. many yeah, years we, we ago. Had her, we had her on in the show, actually. Oh, yeah. fabulous, yeah. fabulous. Um, and um, so I think what's happening now is because so many people are coming out, mm -hmm. women are being believed more. Um, and what's unfortunate Except about for it? By our president. Yes, um, but what's unfortunate about it is it wasn't until kind of white middle class, well-known women came out right. that people started to believe, mm -hmm. um, because people find it so hard to believe. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at this, um, what's going on with um, I think his first name is John Porter, Rob Porter. Oh, right. yeah, Rob you know, Porter, people yeah. are saying he is so great yeah. at what Secretary he did, and you know, such a great person, and it's like yes. And, yeah. <laughs> yes, and he, he beat his wives, you, you know? And so I think people have a really hard time if they've only seen one aspect of somebody mm -hmm. believing anything else. Right, okay. Well, sorry, we're, we're running out of time, so I, I don't want to leave without getting the particulars of what's coming up with the reading of your book, which, it, which tells your story, mm -hmm. right? Um, can you tell us about that and where and when and how people can see it? Yeah, my next book reading is going to be um, March 11th. Um, at 11 o'clock at the Brooklyn Society for Ethical Culture in Brooklyn. Okay, um, and how? where can people go to find information if they want to get tickets, or do they just go, it's free? Uh, they go, it's free. Okay. Um, if they um, want more information, I guess I'll be posting that. Or well, we can put it on your lower third, don't worry about it. We'll, we'll figure a way okay. of communicating that to our viewers. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank I wish you we had more so time much. to talk. We'll thank have to have you. you back. Thanks. Take care. All right, thanks. And thank you for joining us today. And thank goodness Ashley will be back tomorrow to talk about health violations in our school cafeterias, a new local journalism startup using a novel funding model, and a brick and mortar virtual reality space. Hope you'll come back. Mm -hmm.